It probably took me 20 years to become myself. I had to go through a lot of people whose work I admired, you know, and I tried to borrow from them and um, sometimes I'd replicate it. And then all of a sudden, a couple things happened. One of them was meeting, meeting the uh, playwright Horton Foote uh, and his attitude toward creative work. And the other was reading a, a book called, uh, uh, by J. Mason Brewer, uh, Dog Ghosts and Tales Along the Brazos, which were folk tales of uh, African-American folk art stories. And one of them that recur reoccurred all the time was that of the dog ghost. And the theory was, if you were in time of need and a loved one had died, they could come back and protect you in the form of a dog. Now, that mythology is found all over the world, but, it, but that book was from a University of Texas African-American writer, the first one. And it just riveted me, which is one of the reasons you find a lot of animals show up in my work. I had a, I had a grant to photograph my project from the Center for Documentary Studies. The grant was to photograph the poorest and blackest community in the United States. And that was Tunica County, Mississippi at the time. I went to Tunica County, Mississippi with my wife, Pat, and we spent a couple months photographing uh, the vernacular culture in that, that uh, place. And I made a photograph called Garlic. And it's a woman in a striped dress and her hands are upraised. And I come out of an oral culture, oral tradition, a storytelling culture. I come from a small town. Uh, I come from people that you still hear phrases straight out of the King James Bible. I come from a place that is muddy and wet, uh, and you have white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, you have uh, evangelicals, African-American imagination, you have Vietnamese industry. There's much more richness in people's lives, and sometimes in a 60th of a second, uh, if you're prepared for it, uh, than I could ever have imagined before. Wasn't, it was no longer about trying to make photographs about specificity. It was about trying to make photographs that resonated in a, in a larger way, in a larger world. And the photograph called Fireflies are two boys uh, holding a jar of fireflies at the end of a day, uh, standing in a little a pond not too far from where I live, called Screech Isle Pond. And it was a complete mistake. Uh, it, it ended up pretty much changing my life. But at the time, I was trying to make a, a, a well-focused photograph of two boys playing with fireflies. It's a vernacular Southern thing. But they wouldn't hold still. They didn't know me. I had a camera on a tripod, uh, low light, <clears throat> slow shutter speed. And I did 12 exposures. And I looked at them after I developed them and I was so disappointed because I really wanted them to be sharp. And then I showed them to my wife, Pat, and she said, oh, you should go and print one. And I went and printed it and I showed it to her. And then she says, you should print it bigger. And so she comes out in the dark room, which is next door to where I live, and we print it bigger. And she went, oh my goodness. And I went, Oh my goodness. And it was the fact that it wasn't about the specificity, the detailed sharpness. It was a documentary photograph that went so many other places because it was time passing as well as a moment happening uh, that had so many different open-ended caches. And it was about memory. And I wasn't planning on doing that. It just, but that made me start thinking about uh, photographs being small, discrete parcels of time and the aberrations that happen occasionally rather than the perfection, not only in our lives, but in the medium itself. I thought, I love that. I've always loved that kind of thing. It's like blues music, you know, it's, 
it's a form, but it's hardly ever done the same way each time. And that's when uh, uh, my work started to evolve in a true way. But it took almost two decades. At the time, I was not in uh, the academic world, and I was pretty much uh, dependent on books I read regarding photography. At the time, there wasn't so many exhibitions like you see today. I lived in a small town and there wasn't a lot being shown. So I sort of had to educate myself, but I was always influenced by uh, uh, literature too. So, you know, the, the stories and the spoken word, I thought, you know, if I can make pictures that, that uh, re resonate like that, if I could. And that's, that's kind of how it uh, evolved. And I always loved vernacular culture. Those small elliptical moments where grand things happen, uh, but you don't even know it sometimes because they pass so quickly. There are in a lot of my photographs. There's another photograph called Boy and Hawk. I was uh, in Europe and I'd, I'd gone up to on the side of a mountain to see a bird of prey show that I had read about in a small Italian village. And I went up there and there's a handful of people and the fella with a couple of uh, hawks and so on and so forth. Anyway, long story short, the hawk wouldn't fly for whatever reason. And this little boy walked up to look at it and I only had time, I walked up behind him and I made two photographs. And one, he's just staring at the bird. I'm photographing him from the back of the head. I tilt the horizon line a little bit, which breaks the frame and is incorrect. The light was all wrong. Uh, it was coming straight into my lens, but you know, it, you just had to do it anyway. And then, so I make that photograph and then he just throws his hand up like he's scared. I'm behind him. And if you look at the two photographs side by side, the difference of that gesture as opposed to no gesture was like night and day. But I didn't know it until I looked at it. And I started to really try and use that kind of implied gesture and narrative in a lot of my photographs. They seemingly are quiet, but they're things going on. It really uh, isn't hugely useful to anybody else, but I think that our lives are made up with small epiphanies, certainly in the creative world. And my small epiphanies have grown into giant beast beanstalks as I've grown older. I just think, you know, there are certain things I look for and there are certain things I care about. Uh, I don't really care too much about what's temporal or what's in fashion here in this particular decade or what have you. I try to make photographs that are muddy, asymmetrical, humane, intelligent, transcendental, elegant, you know, that, that uh, help inform your life. Oh, excuse me, help inform my life. I wouldn't say they help inform anybody else. That's the way I feel. Well, the great, the great photographer, Deanne, uh, Arbus once said, I've never made a photograph I ever expected. It was always a little better or a little worse. And that's a, that's a truism. There have been some photographs that I've made that sort of led to other photographs. I made a, a, a photograph, uh, I think back in the 80s, of my wife Pat. Uh, uh, and she had just woken up. Uh, we were in Mexico, and I thought she just really looked beautiful, asleep in her eyes, and you know, kind of sentimental thing, I suppose. And she was not amused about it, you know. But I still think it's one of my favorite photographs. It reminded me of Alfred Stieglitz's portrait of jo George O'Keefe, where she just woken up and her hair is wild. And some years later, I make a, a, a portrait in my backyard of a Labrador retriever uh, named Rosie, uh, our dog, and she was lying in the grass. And I did a close-up, and you know, looking at the two, I thought it's the same eyes. They both have the same eyes, 
and it's uh, point being sometimes one photograph influences another photograph but there's can be five six eight ten years you know between the two and that's happened to me uh, uh, several times the other thing I put in my work a lot is sort of subtle anthropomorphic uh, mannerisms uh, giving human characteristics to non-human things for instance I have a photograph uh, called Lost Dog uh, that I've always been very fond of. It was a lost dog. And uh, as I got closer and closer and closer, it didn't move. It just, the ears went back and it just looked at me. And, you know, when I printed that photograph, I thought, I know people that look just like that. I still know people that look just like that. So uh, I'm not trying to romanticize anything in particular, I'm just trying to, to call attention to uh, what an extraordinary world we live in, you know, at least, at least in my view. It's all there for the taking, you just reach up and grab it. The most excited I get is when I uh, walk into a room or walk down a block and you just know there's something here, there's something in the air. There's something here. And I call it one square block of reality. And I think about it all the time. I, I find, let's say you're in Paris or New York or what have you. I find it, for my style, relatively useless just to wander aimlessly outside of the pleasure of wandering and seeing things. I try to find an area where thing I can tell something is happening not a festival or anything but it's just the juxtaposition of people animals uh, culture buildings and if nothing is happening I tell myself make something happen and a lot of times um, that's just using fundamentals getting up higher getting down lower uh, or and this is critical in my world. I tell myself all the time, don't overthink this. Take the photograph. Make the photograph. You've got the rest of your life to figure out what it means. Just make it. So I don't dwell. I see something and I go straight at it. In my style of work anyway. I don't really conceptualize or set things up too often. I'm not above moving somebody two feet over here or something like that, but no rules. In the creative arts, rules is a pejorative term. No rules. I'm very, very fond uh, of a photograph called One-Eared Goat. Uh, that pretty much says everything I have to say about the universe. Most likely something bit that goat's ear off and it was just fearless. It just stared at me and I stared at it and I thought, what in the world, who in the world could design this? This is what the poet Robinson Jeffers called high superfluousness. A one-eared goat staring at you with the same look that you and I are staring at each other now. And that is not germane subject matter in a lot of my colleagues' worlds. To me, I just thought it was glorious. It's not a photograph anybody's gonna buy. You know, it's not gonna make you rich and famous, but I love the image. You know, I, I like it as much as I like fireflies. Uh, those kinds of things. So, I think everybody has to find their own path, you know. I have wonderful students now, and they're on that same road. You just, you have to work a while, you have to read a lot, you have to go to exhibitions, you have to see what's going on, you have to have conversations. It's not a smart thing to work in a vacuum all the time. And then you just have to pay your nickel and take your chance, do the work. And after a period of time, things start to evolve in a more effortless way. That's been my experience anyway. 
there's two other photographs that influenced themselves or, or influenced each other, I suppose. One is called Chicken Feathers, uh, and it's three African American children in costumes starting to rain in the evening uh, in a farmyard and I saw them coming out and they were getting ready to go trick-or-treating. I was on a rural road. So I photographed them standing in the chicken feathers in their rural yard and they had sparklers and they didn't sparkle, they just smoked. And I love that photograph. It's just ironic and it's like a metaphor. Uh, and it was a documentary photograph and all kinds, but it went so many other places. And then some years later, I made a photograph called Megan's New Shoes, which is truly one of my favorites. And I decided to rip off that photograph, Chicken Feathers, for an ad. And it was for shoes, this clothing line shoes. So I put my granddaughter, Megan, in the client's shoes in a tutu and I put her in front of my studio door and I put 15 sparklers together ripping off the same photograph and then I lit them and I got back to the camera and they started to sparkle and then they just exploded. They didn't sparkle, they just smoked and uh, it was just fantastic. Anyway, um, all heck broke loose I only made one photograph for I ran up to, the, to Megan and grabbed all that stuff. Point being, when I developed the film, there's that one exposure. She never moved her feet. You could never imagine that photograph. And it's one of my true favorites. And it was an accident. One of my great heroes is the mythologist Joseph Campbell. Of the many intelligent things he said, one of them was, accidents in your life and often become main plots. And I think about that a lot. As I grew older and I, and I would, would deconstruct photographs I'd made or people whose work I greatly admired, um, everybody from Joel Peter Whitgen to Irving Penn to Robert Frank, oh, great, great photographers. Uh, I started to deconstruct my pictures, the ones that worked. And uh, I saw I was drawn to uh, an oblique angle, which means I don't put the photograph straight, uh, the camera directly in front of you. I put it a slightly off to the side, and then I will tilt it just a hair. And then I will tilt it again, just a hair. Just where things look not quite right, but not enough to make you think uh, something's wrong here. Uh, that's the difference to me about making a photograph or taking a photograph. After a period of time, when you figure out what works for you, you're more inclined to, rightly or wrongly, think about, I'm going to make this work here, I'm going to make this work here, I'm going to make this body of work here, rather than take this. It's probably a, a nebulous uh, distinction, but um, uh, I, I carry that with me all the time. I know exactly what to do. If I see something, I know precisely what I want to do. I don't generally putz around. It doesn't always work, but I thought in Western music, there are 12 notes. You know, if you play piano, it's an octave is 12 notes. All of those notes are available to anybody in Western music to compose with. It's the same 12 notes. But if you play the blues, that's the minor pentatonic scale. That's five notes. B.B. King, Eric Clapton. You, know. you play five notes and every melody you like is made with those same five notes. And I got to thinking about that and I thought, you know, that's pretty much what I do. I play five notes at my mature stage of age. You know, I will place the camera off a little bit, I will tilt it, I will tilt it again. You know, I will use short depth of field, uh, which means the background goes out of focus, which is how the eye actually sees. And maybe one other, one other little thing, but I don't really do a whole lot of technical expertise. You know, uh, it, kind of, it kind of bores me. I mean, just perfect photographs just bore me, I always have. 
It's the muddiness that, that I like. Bending the string on the guitar rather than hitting the G. I'm thankful for what I've been able to make. I'm thankful for the experiences. I'm thankful for the people I've met. I'm thankful for the riches. I don't mean monetarily uh, that have embellished my life through the work. Um, the art of photography makes you pay a certain attention. That when I have a camera in my hand, I tell myself, I'm in the game. <laughs>